There are several interesting things that can transpire when it comes to questions and answers. One of the things that we find is this. Oftentimes there are very simple questions that individuals give very complex answers to. You go into some college settings, maybe a college uh, class in philosophy, and they ask this very simple question. Do you exist? And folks, you would be amazed at how complex the answers are to that particular question. As far as I'm concerned, all you have to do is pinch yourself and you know exactly whether you exist or not. And then there are other questions that are asked and they are extremely complex in nature. Just a moment ago was read in our hearing an event in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, the Sadducees were some of the scholars of the day. They had studied the biblical text and they believed that they had come up with all kinds of arguments in order to prove their points. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And therefore they came up with this extremely complex question, at least in their minds, with regard to a marriage situation. And the question was, whose shall she be in the resurrection? Jesus, very simply very easily answers the question and totally annihilates their teaching. So some questions, even though they're complex, can be asked very, very simply. Every first Sunday of the night of the month, we ask questions and strive to give answers. And folks, I do my best to try to read those questions and answer them exactly the way that you are asking them. It's interesting to me, though, there are some individuals who will come up to me after I have answered a question, and they'll say something like this, Preacher, I don't think the questioner was asking it that way. And I always kind of chuckle when I hear that. And the reason I chuckle is this. If this individual is not the one asking the question, my question to him would be this. How do you know whether that's what he wanted to say or not? And my second question is this, if you are the one asking the question, why didn't you ask it right to begin with so that I could answer it correctly? We've got four questions. That's a bunch, isn't it? Four questions that we're going to try to answer this evening. Question number one, stated very simply, is this, does God create evil? And then there is a reference to Isaiah 45, verse 7. I think the best thing that we can do is go to Isaiah 45, verse 7, and read what it says. For there, notice what God says. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Isn't that interesting? God says, I create evil. So the question is, is God really the creator of evil? And the answer to that has to be what? The answer to that has to be yes, but we need to understand some things about this evil, don't we? The thing that we really need to understand is that evil can be defined in at least two ways. The very first way and the most common way involves evil that is immorality. Evil that involves sin. Evil that involves rebellion against the Almighty God. In Genesis 6 verse 5, the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Folks, what God is talking about there is immorality. He's talking about rebellion against God. He's talking about individuals who refuse to abide by His will. Their thoughts were evil continually. But there is a second definition of the word evil found in the pages of God's Word. And the term evil can mean the calamities and judgments that God brings against a people that are in rebellion against Him. When we turn to Jeremiah 4 verse 6, notice what the Bible says. He says this, Set up the standard toward Zion. Then he goes on to say, Retire. Stay not. Now listen to what he says. I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. 
Notice that God says, I am about to bring evil against Zion. Folks, the evil that he's talking about there involves judgments, calamities of God against a rebellious people. Individuals who refuse to do his will. Let's go back now to the context of Isaiah 45 verse 7. Let's look right at the verse. Notice that there is a contrast that is made in that verse. He says this, I make peace and I create evil. Notice the contrast is between peace and evil. The peace about which he's talking is a peace wherein a group of individuals are obeying the command of the Almighty God. These individuals have prosperity. These individuals have tranquility. These individuals have the goodness, the benevolence of God being poured out upon their land. But he also says, not only do I make peace, but I create evil. If individuals rebel against me, if individuals say that I am not going to do what God desires, I create evil against them. Now let's back up from that verse just a little bit and let's consider not only the verse itself, but also the context in the chapter. We go all the way back to verse 1. In verse 1, God says that he is going to raise up a man, and he names the man. He says that I am going to raise up an individual. In fact, he refers to him as my anointed by the name of Cyrus. For Cyrus is ultimately going to become the king of the Persian nation. And God has appointed him to do his bidding. God has looked down the quarters of time and God has chosen him to carry out his will, to be his instrument against certain individuals and for certain individuals. I find it interesting that he's going to be an instrument of evil against some, according to verse 1. God says, and I will hold in his hand that he may, listen to him, subdue nations. Here is a king who is going to rise up and punish certain nations, particularly the nation of Babylon. Folks, this king by the name of Cyrus is going to be evil against Babylon. But when you go on to verse 4, he says that he's going to be peace for Israel and for Jacob. For Jacob's, my servant's sake, and for Israel, my elect. I have named thee, talking about Cyrus. Folks, Cyrus is going to be the king that lets Israel go from Babylonian captivity. He's going to be their deliverer. He's going to send them out of the land back to the land of Israel. He's going to allow them to rebuild the temple. He's going to allow them to rebuild the city walls in Jerusalem. They're going to reestablish the law. They're going to reestablish the sacrifices. They're going to reestablish... The Levitical priesthood. They're going to be prosperous. There's going to be peace again. God says, I am the one. I am the one who either makes peace or creates evil. God is in charge of the nations, my friends. God is in control of that. If you want to do a good study tonight before you go to bed... Go look up the phrase, I will bring evil. Those words are spoken by God in at least 25 verses in the pages of the Old Testament. And what you're going to find is this. Every time that God says, I'm going to bring evil, He's bringing a calamity, He's bringing a judgment against a very sinful, rebellious group of individuals. Let's look at just one passage, Jeremiah 25, verse 29. All we need are those opening words of this particular text. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. Folks, he tells Jerusalem that I am about to raise up evil against you. I am about to bring a judgment, a calamity against you. Notice the very next statement. And should you be utterly unpunished. See, he's talking about punishment. Punishment for what? 
Punishment for disobedience. Punishment for idolatry. Punishment for rebellion. Punishment for alliances with foreign nations. Punishment because they refuse to do what God says do. I will bring evil against the city that is called by my name. So there's two definitions of evil. One of them involves immorality and the other involves calamities. God is not the creator of immorality. But God is the creator of calamity and judgments against sinful people. Question number two. Very interesting one. Can an elder serve in the position of an elder if his wife dies? Interesting question. And let me tell you what. Many of you may say, well, that's pretty simple. But there is a huge division in our brotherhood, even among gospel preachers, with regard to the answer to this particular question. The first thing that we need to do is we need to go to the qualifications, don't we? There are two lists of qualifications for elders found in the pages of God's Word. The first one is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The second is Titus 1, verses 5 through 9. And both of them begin with the same two qualifications. The Bible says that an elder must be blameless and the husband of one wife. The literal translation of that second requirement is this. A one woman man. Now like I said, there is a lot of controversy with regard to this particular text. There's two main views. First, there is what I refer to as a literal interpretation. If a man is going to serve in the position of an elder, he must be the husband of one wife. If that woman dies, then that man no longer fulfills the qualification. Therefore, it is his responsibility to resign as an elder. But there is another group of individuals who look at what they say is the purpose of the command. They don't look just at the command itself, the requirement itself. They say, what you really need to understand is why this particular qualification was given. God wanted to see a man who's going to be faithful to his mate. Here's a man who was installed as an elder at the age of 50. He was a one-woman man at that particular time. He had been married for 25 years. He continued to be married for another 27 years. And finally, his wife dies. Are you telling me that he's now disqualified just because his wife dies? They say, see, the real requirement here is not that he's married to a one-woman, but that he was faithful to that woman throughout the entirety of that marriage. So what's the answer? I'll get in trouble for this, but that's okay. Folks, the qualification does not say that a man must be faithful to his wife, does it? That's not what the, that's not what the qualification says. If God had wanted a man to be faithful to his wife, don't you think he would have just written that? I mean, just think about all the other requirements that are in The list of qualifications. Sober. Not a striker. Not given to wine. If God had wanted a man to be faithful, that's what he would have said. I want a man who is faithful, but that's not what he said. God said, I want a man to be the husband of one wife. And the reality is this. That when a mate dies... That man and woman are no longer bound in the marriage relationship. Romans 7 verse 2. For a woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Folks, you can't get any plainer than that. Here's a man who is married to a woman. He is a one-woman man. 
but his mate dies. At that point, he no longer meets the qualification to be an elder. And it is essential for that individual to step down because he is no longer qualified. Rather than surmising as to why God gave a command, isn't it much more responsible as far as hermeneutics is concerned to just take the literal interpretation of the biblical text? Folks, I could surmise all kind of things about the commands of God. God doesn't want us surmising. God wants us following His instructions and His dictates. The man steps down from an eldership because his wife dies. Later on, he marries. Oh, yes, it's his second marriage, but guess what? He's still the husband of what? One wife. That other marriage bond has been dissolved. That other marriage bond is no longer binding because of the death of his mate. He's still a one-woman man. If he marries again, he can then be appointed again into the eldership over a congregation. Question number three. Please explain how Exodus 31.3 relates to us today. Look at this next statement. If it does. Sometimes when I get a question, I'm kind of astounded at the question being answered. I look up the verse and I read the verse and I say, is this really the verse that they wanted me to talk about? And that was the way this particular one is. Here's what the verse says. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all workmanship. That's a weird passage, isn't it? What does that passage mean? Does that particular passage relate to us today? I believe that it does. And I believe that it can relate to us in at least two different ways. Let's talk about the passage for just a minute. The words involve a man by the name of Bezalel. Bezalel was selected by the Almighty God as the individual who was to oversee the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai. He had received the law. He had received all the instructions with regard to this tabernacle. And God made this statement. See that thou buildest it according to the pattern that I have given thee. Folks, God wanted that tabernacle erected exactly the way He authorized it to be built. No more, no less. In order to ensure that was done... A man was selected by the name of Bezalel. And he was appointed as the overseer of the building of the tabernacle. But notice that he was not given just his own wisdom to carry through with those instructions. Oh no. God did not leave him to his own devices. God said what? God said, I will fill him with the Spirit of God. In what? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and in all workmanship. Folks, God wanted that tabernacle built exactly and precisely as it had been authorized. Now that's important. And we need to hold on to that for a moment or two. But let's talk about the two ways that this particular passage can be applied to us. First... You and I come to understand when we see a passage like this that the Holy Spirit of God was active in the Old Testament. There are some individuals who would have us to believe that the Holy Spirit really wasn't very vibrant, wasn't very active until the New Testament. And that is far, far, far from the truth, isn't it? Folks, the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Godhead, He was constantly working and laboring even in the Old Testament. And he was doing many, many things. And we can just read of several. He assisted in the creation. Genesis 1 verse 2. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
He was the one who garnished the heavens. Folks, He was the one who decorated the heavens. He was involved in the creation of God. What does that display? That displays the mighty power of the Holy Spirit of God, does it not? Point number two. He was actively involved in the revelation of truth to mankind. On one occasion, David spoke these words. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was in my tongue. 1 Samuel 23, verse 7. The prophecies that we have in the Old Testament, the books that we have in the Old Testament, those 39 books, not one of them, not one of them was delivered without the Spirit of the Almighty God. Every one of them are just as inspired as the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Point number three, God empowered men to do the work that He designed for them to do. I find it interesting when God told Moses to select for him those 72 elders, those extra judges who would be able to judge the children of Israel, that God was going to fill those men with the Spirit of God so that they could make good decisions for the people of God. We find individuals like the judges, Samson, how did he have such great power? It wasn't just because he had long hair. He was filled with power because the Spirit of God was with him, folks. Gideon was another who also had the Spirit of God resting upon him. The kings of the Old Testament were individuals who had the Spirit of God. David said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David was a man who was filled with the Spirit of God. The prophets, the Bible says, spoke by means of the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Talking about those Old Testament prophets. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. Now the reason that all that's important is this. We pick up our Bibles and we start reading in the book of Genesis. And all of a sudden we start seeing all these things that the Spirit is doing. He's powerful. He's the revealer of the word of the living God. He insists and He empowers individuals to do the work of the Almighty God. Then I turn into the pages of the New Testament and I'm not surprised at all by anything that the Holy Spirit is doing. He is doing exactly then or now what He was doing in the Old Testament just to a greater extent than He did of old. So there's one application of that text to us. But here's the second application. And I believe the most important. Here is a physical tabernacle to be erected in the wilderness. Folks, it's just a lot of boards, a lot of beams, a lot of curtains, a lot of gold, several pieces of furniture that have to be built and placed into the tabernacle. And yet God was concerned about how well and how precisely that tabernacle would be built. And in order to make certain that that tabernacle was built correctly, He filled a man, Bezalel, with the Spirit of God to make certain it was done right. That tabernacle was a type of the church in the New Testament. Question. If God was concerned about the erection of a physical tabernacle, do you think He was concerned about the construction of a spiritual tabernacle? In the first century? Absolutely. And do you honestly think that God would leave man to his own devices in order to erect that church? Absolutely not. And the same spirit that was given to Bezalel was given to men in the first century in order for them to do the work of God. John 16 verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, He shall guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. 
Jesus spoke those words. To whom was he speaking them? The apostles that he had chosen as his own personal ambassadors. You're going to be filled with the Spirit of God in order to do the work of God. I'm going to build my church. And it's not going to be left to the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge of man. Oh no. The Spirit of God will guide these men in building this spiritual tabernacle. What was it that Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13? Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Folks, when God built His church... He made dead certain in the first century that church was built exactly the way He desired for it to be built. And we have that pattern in the pages of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And it is not for you and it is not for me to decide how the church is to operate, how the church is to be organized, What is to be the doctrine of the church? What are the entrance requirements of the church? Oh no. Folks, all of that has been revealed unto us by the Holy Spirit of God in the pages of the New Testament. God continues, even to this day, to guide and govern His church through the precious, inspired Word of God. Interesting question. Question number four. In Ezekiel 43 verse 7, Jerusalem and the temple are referred to as God's dwelling place. Now listen to what God says after that. God says, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel, listen to this word, forever. Wow. Forever. What does forever mean? Forever means forever. Forever means everlasting. Forever means for always and for always and for always. Folks, this is not the only text that talks about God doing things in the Old Testament forever and ever and ever. There's another word that's used and it's everlasting. And God says that there are many everlasting things in the Old Covenant. Listen to what He says. He says, the land of Canaan will be given to the children of Israel as an everlasting possession. Another point that he makes is this. Circumcision shall be an everlasting covenant. Another point that he makes is that the Levitical priesthood is an everlasting priesthood. Another point that he makes, the atonement, that is on the seventh month, tenth day, the slaying of that calf. That is an everlasting statute to the children of Israel. The word forever is used several times as well. The land of Canaan will be given to the children of Israel forever. Passover is a covenant that is forever. We see also that the Sabbath is forever. The sacrifices were forever. Folks, the premillennialists have a heyday with these passages that use the words everlasting and forever. Do we not have a group of individuals in our society today, a group of religious individuals who will tell us that the children of Israel are God's chosen people even today? They will always be His people, they say. They also tell us that the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine, the land of Israel today is still... For the Jews and the Jews only. And it will always be their possession. God promised it to them forever and ever and ever. And the arguments look pretty stout, don't they? Man, the Bible does say that this possession is everlasting. The Bible does say this possession is forever and ever and ever. God does say, I will dwell in the midst of my people, the children of Israel, forever. So how do we answer 
that particular argument? Well, the reality is this. There are two different ways to answer this idea of Israel having these things forever and ever and ever. Point number one. Folks, the Old Testament covenant was a conditional covenant. When you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 15 through 20, you see God's giving the covenant to the children of Israel as a conditional covenant. If you do what I tell you to do, if you obey the things that I command you to obey, then these things will be yours forever and ever and ever. But verse 17 says something interesting. But if thine heart turn away, and thou will not hear. Uh Uh-oh. Now we have a group of individuals who are in rebellion to the covenant. Now we have a group of individuals who are no longer doing what God expects of them to do as far as the covenant is concerned. In verse 18, God tells them plainly what's going to happen. Ye will utterly perish. That your days should not be prolonged in that land. And he goes on to tell them exactly which land that is. The land that they were about to pass over the Jordan and take as their possession. You see, God says, yes. I'm going to give you these promises forever and ever and ever if you obey. But if you don't, guess what? The forever comes to an end. Now you turn to Hebrews chapter 8 verses 7 and 8 and you find a very interesting statement. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. Now watch this next statement. For finding fault With them, he saith, Behold, the days come when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. What did the writer say? Finding fault with them. Folks, Israel violated the covenant of God. Israel did not stand true to that covenant. When they forsook that covenant, God was no longer bound to fulfill the promises therein at all, including all the promises based upon things being forever. In other words, we could say this, had Israel kept the covenant, then guess what? Those promises, as far as God was concerned, would have still been binding today, but they didn't. And therefore, those promises are not binding. But here's another interesting take. Sometimes the word forever does not refer to eternally. Sometimes the term forever refers to a long, long period of time. Y'all say it all the time. That preacher preaches forever. But you get to go home. What you mean by that is that preacher just preaches for a long period of time. Notice that second point. Sometimes it means for the completion of a set period of time. Let me give you two illustrations of what we're talking about. Exodus 21 verse 6. This is the verse from which we get a song. Usually young people sing it. Sometimes we sing it in the auditorium here. Pierce my ear. The Bible says that if a man had a servant and that servant did not want to leave his master, the master would take him to the judge's. The servant would then be brought before the door or before a doorpost. And he would take an awl and he would pierce his ear. And listen to how that verse ends. And he shall be his servant forever. Man, if forever means ever and ever and ever like we think of it oftentimes. We got folks today still serving their masters as servants. But that's not what it means, is it? It means for the completion of a set period of time, forever, as long as that servant lives, he will be the master's servant. You see, for a long period of time, but that time ultimately comes to an end. We turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22. Hannah finally has Samuel. 
Her husband always goes up to the feast at Jerusalem, but Hannah decides that I'm not going until this child is weaned. And in verse 22 she says this, that once the child is weaned, I will go up and I will give him unto the Lord that he may abide there, listen to this, forever. Question. Is Samuel still serving in the courts in Jerusalem to this day? Oh, wait a minute. His mama said she's going to give him forever. Folks, we, if forever means eternally, like we think of it so often, then we ought to be able to go to Jerusalem and look up Samuel. He ought to still be serving over there, but that's not what the word means, is it? He will serve for a long period of time until the completion of all the days of his life. When God made the promise to Israel, he could have meant this. He could have meant that I will promise all these things to you until the end of the Mosaic age. Folks, was that age a long period of time? Sure. A long period of time. And then that time would ultimately come to an end. So forever can be defined in different ways. Conclusion. All four of our questions tonight have involved Bible passages, haven't they? Folks, those are the ones that I love more than any other questions. You know that? Just go to the Bible text and let's study what the Bible has to say. And let's try to come to a better understanding of Scripture. My desire for you is this. Yes, it's fine to have questions. But folks, don't just stop with questions. It is too easy today to find answers to our questions. You know that? It used to be hard. And I'm talking within my lifetime, it used to be a lot harder. You used to have to go to the library, check out books... Search through books, read articles after article after article. Now all you have to do, type in Google. And thousands of pages come up and you can study diligently and find answers to your questions. It's fine to ask questions, but folks, diligently search until you find the correct answer for that question. There's a question that's vital for all men to ask, isn't it? Maybe the most important question that any man could ask. And what's so sad is we have billions and billions of people on our globe who will never ask it. And the question's pretty simple. What must I do to be saved? You know, there's people right here in Paris, Tennessee... Who've never asked that question. Sad, isn't it? Because the answer is simple in the pages of God's Word. Jesus said that you have to believe in me or you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. Jesus said you must repent. You must have a change of heart that leads to a change of action or else you will perish, Luke 13, 3. He says, you must confess me before men if you expect me to stand before the throne of God and confess you before the Father. Matthew 10, 32. And my friends, it was Jesus who said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Very simple answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? But you know what? As a Christian, we sin again, don't we? We struggle with temptation. And we fall into sin. And fortunately, God has given a second way to be forgiven. If we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe there's sin in your life you need to take care of. Maybe it's public. And you need to ask forgiveness and ask for the prayers of the congregation. Do you need to do that? Won't you come as together we stand and sing?